mute and say hello. So first, I'm going to introduce Mel, Melissa Morgan, our communications director. Hello. 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 And then we have Diana Martinez, our communications manager. Hey, everyone. Good morning. And we have Leg O, our community organizer. And we have Rudy Cardoso, our communications coordinator. Good morning, everybody. Happy to be here. All right. And now I'd like to invite you guys to answer the second prompt. And please put in the chat one word you would use to describe how you feel about your knowledge of digital safety. We'll also put that prompt. Ongoing, okay, some people say out of date. Mel says informed. Kirsten says limited. Okay. And now for the third prompt. I would like to ask you guys, how do you feel about children interacting online with strangers? And then we'll see what everyone says. Inappropriate and unsafe. I agree. Francesca says the same way I feel about children interacting in person with strangers. It's a no. Scared and unsafe. Okay, we're getting similar um, answers. Okay, and lastly, for our fourth prompt, um, please put in the chat, how often do you post online personal photos of your children? Okay. Mel says all the time, often. Okay, we're getting a little bit of both. Not often, sometimes. It's a spectrum. Oh, good morning, Miss Joycelyn. Okay, we have never. These are all. Okay, okay. All right, everyone, thank you for your feedback. Um, today, we're just gonna have a rich conversation about how to keep your kids safe online. We thank you all for waking up early this morning to join in community together with us and our Best Start team. And now I'm going to give it back to our communications coordinator, Rudy. We'll share some background about Best Start Central Long Beach. Rudy. Thanks, Angelica. Um, before I get started, uh, I'd like to welcome the project delegate for this project in particular. Uh, Ms. Joycelyn, would you like to say hello? Rudy, I think you're muted or not in the right channel. Rudy, don't forget to um, also join a language and a mute original audio. Can you hear me? Got it. Can you guys hear me now? Can folks yes. hear me? Great. Thank you, Angelica. Um, our project delegate for this project, Ms. Joycelyn, is now with us. So I'd like to um, introduce her and have her share some words um, if she would like. Ms. Joycelyn, um, take it away. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning. I've been on, but for whatever reason, I couldn't get things in the chat. I think she might have to resolved. choose the channel Good morning, well. everybody. Thank so you so much So if you just joined, please choose the globe please. icon at the bottom right of your screen to enable your language, and okay. if you're speaking English, select the English, okay. and then you'll go back to that same area, click again, 
and choose mute original audio so we can hear you. Okay. Mute. We'll give her a second. We can come back to her, Rudy, if you want to introduce uh, Best Start. Okay, no worries. So, um, yeah, introducing a little bit about what Best Start is. So, Best Start Central Long Beach is an initiative funded by First 5 LA, and they're working to create the best possible community for young children and their families. Best Start brings together parents, community organizations, institutions, and others in Long Beach to improve policies and resources to better support parents and create a community where children and families can thrive. Best Start also provides skill building and leadership training to help the group achieve its goals and ensure that children are safe, healthy, and ready to learn. All right, so next I'd like to share with you folks some background on this social project. Uh, it was created through our previous participatory budgeting process. And we're only gonna show you a clip of this video created to you by our colleague, Lydia Flores. Um, welcome everyone again. I see some familiar faces and a lot of new ones. So just to explain what Best Start is, we are an initiative of First 5 LA. We are composed of families, community groups, local institutions, and people like you who want to work together to create a community where children under the age of five and their families can thrive. So with that in mind, um, all of the work that comes out of Best Start is follows four community change agenda goals. So what you can see on the screen are four different priority areas that the community decided are very important and prevalent in Long Beach. So all of the projects, all of the programs, all of the, the types of conversations that we have together are to uh, move forward with all of these uh, goals. So just to go down the list, one of the community change agenda goals is to build community knowledge on child development and parenting skills. The second one is prevent child abuse and neglect. The third is increase access to quality and affordable childcare. And last but not least, the fourth is increase access to quality and affordable housing and economic security. So these are pretty broad. Um, because it's so important and it can look a lot of different ways on how we work together to meet those needs for the community. So all of these projects, including this project that has come out of participatory budgeting followed the process of participatory budgeting. And with the next slide, you'll see a little bit more of how that actually looked like. So as you all can see, the purpose of PB, as we like to call it, is to involve the community members in a democratic process in order to allocate a certain amount of funds. Sometimes, uh, well, the first year it was about $400,000, and uh, most recently it was $200,000. So it's to involve the community in a democratic process in order to allocate $200,000 towards those four community change agenda goals. And we do that by working with the community directly. Um, a lot of you who know who we are might have been part of that process as early as last year, November, where we start with an idea collection, um, where we learn what the community wants, how, they, how you all want um, a potential project to look like to meet one of those needs and then followed by a proposal development phase where all those ideas and those common themes are combined um, to make an actual specific proposal that has its own timeline, its own budget, its own anticipated outcomes. Then followed by voting 
So the same community that provided those ideas can vote on those final projects. Finally, implementation. So actually making those, making that paper, that, uh, that proposal document reality. So this project is a fantastic example of what the community wanted, what the community has designed, and what the community is receiving and understanding and being part of and leading it as well. Um, All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening to a little bit about what Best Art is and participatory budgeting and how this project came to be. All right. Now I'd like to introduce, introduce my colleague, Lek, who is a community organizer with our Best Start Central Long Beach team. Take it away, Lek. Thank you, Rudy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lek Kenao. I am an uh, organizer community in Best Start. Um, today is Cambodian New Year Day. I'm so happy, <laughs> feeling excited. Okay, uh, today I would like to recognize anyone here that this morning who is the part of the Best Start Leadership Team or the Best Start Network. Do we have any Best Start member here today? I think I see one, Karina Mendoza. Karina Mendoza, are you in here? Would you like to uh, sí, turn on your estoy. camera and say hello? Thank you. Do you have any word to this to everyone in here? Hola a todos. Me da gusto que todos estén aquí participando y que ojalá que cada año seamos más. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, And I would like to uh, ask Miss Jocelyn to unmute and say hello to everyone, please. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Miss Jocelyn, can you unmute and say hello? Yes. Can you, can you hear me okay? okay? Yes. Welcome. Okay. Hey. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. This has been an, an extraordinary experience. It has been an honor to work with Bessar Long Beach Forward on this project. And when they say at award ceremonies or whatever the case is, I like couldn't do it by myself. That is really, really true because everybody has brought this to fruition beyond what I pictured. So thank you to all of our collaboratives, particularly Bessar the Long Beach Unified School District and everybody that Melissa has mentioned, we really truly appreciate it. And thank you for the impactful sessions that we have had because it does take a village, it takes a community and we're very grateful to everyone. So I just wanna encourage everybody to keep up the good work because you are doing an extraordinary job and I feel very humbled to be working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Jocelyn. Thank you so much. So if everyone in here want to learn more about a Best Start program, please go visit our website, www.lbforward.org slash best start, please. And thank you. And please take back Angelina, Angelica. Thank you. Thank you, Lek. So now we're gonna, I would like to learn a little bit more about you all and your children or the children you care for and some of the ideas, your ideas about the internet and social media. Um, we're gonna start a survey on your computer screens for those of you who are joining us on Zoom today. Um, if you are joining us on social media, feel free to write your answers to the questions 
in the comment section of the social media platform you are on watching this on. So the first question is, what age range are your children or the children you care for? see. And then the second question is what, uh, what apps or online games do your children play? So we have things like YouTube, Roblox, Minion Rush, TikTok, which is a really big one, um, Snapchat, or, and then the third question is, do you ever talk to your kids about who they play these online games with. Okay, and I'm also gonna post the questions in the chat as well. So far, about 12 people responded. So we'll give it a couple seconds for everyone to click on their computer or their phone or their tablet to answer the question. Okay. We have Kirsten that says, I don't allow her six-year-old child to play online games, only on Kindle Fire with Wi-Fi disabled, but there was no NA option in the poll. Thank you, Kirsten. We'll, we'll take that into consideration for our next workshop or any polls that we have. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll so we can see the results. <laughs> so for the first question, we got 54% of elementary school kids is the range of what we care for, what you guys care for. 38% is ages zero to five and 38% um, of high schoolers, which is ninth through 12th grade. And then the second question, what apps or online games do your children play? 62% of people said YouTube, which was the highest percentage of this um, question. 38% said roadblocks. 31% um, said TikTok. 15% um, kids use Snapchat. 8% use camera. And 46% of viewers said something else. And so for the last question, do you ever talk to your kids about who they play these online games with? 69% of you guys said yes often, and that was the highest percentage. And 23% said sometimes, and 8% said no. So I would just like to thank you all for participating in this poll. Um, I would like to pass the program to Rudy to bring back to explore more about digital safeties, do's and don'ts with us. Rudy. All right. Thank you, Angelica. And thank you everybody for sharing with us. Um, now moving on to digital safety do's and don'ts. So virtual communities nowadays have opened up a world for kids, everybody um, to chat, network, stay connected, and share interests with each other. But fortunately, with this opportunity, um, you know, there's people out there to do harm. So we have to make sure we're able to take the steps to protect our children. So a term that we've brought up in discussion um, earlier is sharing team. Um, so this term basically means when parents overshare photos, videos and other data about their children's private lives on social media and this happens anytime an adult in charge of a child's well-being uh, it could be a parent teacher a sibling um, transmits private details about a child via digital channels and via digital channels it means social media any anything on the internet um, 
where it can be exposed to strangers. And studies have estimated that by the year 2030, nearly two thirds of identity fraud cases affecting today's children will have resulted from sharing team. So it's important to be mindful of what we share online because there might be some repercussions in the future. Here's a video I would like to share with everybody on sharing team gone too far. And um, I think it's very uh, insightful for everybody to give a listen to. Your child's likeness is absolutely being used in external accounts to then who are in other children or predators to groom. These are the unforeseen consequences of sharenting. Sharenting is everything from sharing an individual picture of a child to parental public oversharing that we see on blogging accounts with families. The average parent will post 1,500 pictures of their child on social media before they turn five. Children's identities can be stolen and used in things like baby role play, in which Instagram users steal images of children, give them a new name and personality, and claim them as their own or pretend to be the kids themselves. Predators are using children's likeness online to create profiles who are in other children. You look like the same age as me. You want to play Roblox? And they used Stephanie's daughter picture that she posted to pose as this little girl to lure in other children to then gain access to them to begin the grooming process. And photos can end up in the last place a parent would ever want them to. The majority of the content that's found in places like NAMBLA websites and men looking for boys and men looking for girls websites is not new photos of your children, but it's pictures of their feet and it's pictures of their arms and their wrists. The number one saved photo to a predator's computer when the FBI seizes it is the copper tone baby. But it's not just other people's actions that can cause harm. Constantly having to worry about putting on a show and then having to act in a very certain way in order to meet this image that people almost expect of you is absolutely a lot of pressure, especially on young kids. There's the, the fact that people know who I am, that I, and I've had no say in this. So there's that lack of control in my life that could absolutely lead to mental health issues. What a parent posts doesn't just disappear as the child grows up. Posts can and probably will live online forever. And by the age of 12, kids are extremely aware of that fact, according to one survey. A fourth of children said their parents post about them made them embarrassed, anxious, or worried. I currently work with a handful of, they are no longer children, but they are still minors who were raised inside of Sharon team, particularly family vlog accounts who are coming out and speaking out about the extraordinary trauma that they endured inside of this level of exploitation. They feel unsafe in public. They've had their identity stolen on multiple occasions. They've been over-sexualized and they feel at any given time they are higher statistically probably likely to experience either further exploitation or human trafficking. Even if a post seems harmless, photos and videos have the potential to be found by the child's future employers, friends, and romantic prospects. When these kids turn 18 and 19 and 20, they now have a social media and internet presence that they had zero say in what was up there. When I came down that rabbit hole, I came to the conclusion that there was no way I could safely share my child online without them being used for insidious purposes. It doesn't mean you can't post your kids, but here are some tips from experts on doing so respectfully. Don't reveal your child's location or personal information in the photo. Get the child's consent before sharing an image or video. Give the child veto power over what's being posted. Set up Google alerts for children's names in case something is posted. In an effort to help inform parents and guardians, public health campaigns are being worked on to draw attention to the conflict between a parent's freedom to post and a child's right to privacy. In some countries, laws are catching up to technology faster than in others. A court in Europe ruled that internet providers must give users the right to be forgotten. In France, children are actually able to sue their parents for being posted without prior consent. Personally, I would love to see social media apps putting rules in place about how much these accounts are allowed to be making videos about young kids. Whether laws are in place or not, parents should think twice before posting their child and take precautions when doing so.
All right, I skipped this video, but I definitely want to share this as well. When it comes to posting on social media, some parents overshare more than their own children. But who is policing them? And are they crossing the line? Parents love posting their daily lives on social media. Anything from their child's first day of school to fun family trips to the beach. Sharenting has become the part of our daily lives. But when does sharenting go too far? In a study out of the University of Michigan, 56% of respondents knew of parents who had shared potentially embarrassing information about their children online. And 51% sought instances where parents provided details of their child's whereabouts at a given time. Children are trusting their parents to keep them protected and safe. But are they doing a good enough job? Stacy Steinberg is joining me today. She's a legal skills professor at the University of Florida Levin College of Law, a photographer and a mom. She's also the author of a new book called Growing Up Shared. Stacy, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, so it was your, your sense of responsibility as a mom that really inspired you to write this book, right? Yeah, so I'm a former child abuse prosecutor, and so I know firsthand the dangers that are lurking past the parents' news feed. There is a dark side that, um, to parenting that involves pedophiles taking pictures off of family social media sites. Um, an Australian study found that 50% of the images on pedophile image sharing sites actually had originated on social media. And these weren't all pictures of children who were naked or engaged, engaged horrifically in sexual acts. These were average everyday pictures that sometimes were being shared as they were. Other times they were being turned into what, what's called morphed child pornography or what a lot of people consider deep fakes where an innocent image of a child is uh, combined or morphed with a sexualized image of, as an, of an adult and then that is shared as, as child pornography. There aren't a lot of laws uh, that limit what parents can post online about their children. There is the uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of 1998 that limits what uh, third parties can collect and share about kids who are using the internet. But there's really nothing that limits what a parent can share. And when parents post online, they can often be uh, giving up personal information to third parties, and they need to consider that the information can end up in dangerous hands. Uh, we also know that identity theft is a problem, and in 10 years' time, there have been studies that suggest that identity theft will often be based on the personal information that parents are posting to their social media news feed. And even with what you've learned, you still share, and you think it's good in some way. Yeah, so when I started this research, I really expected to walk away never wanting to share again. But along with all the dangers, I also saw firsthand how families became better connected with their communities on social media. I saw, saw firsthand how it helps people relate, connects them, informs them. You know, a lot of families turn to social media for advice and for giving advice. And these things weren't possible before there was social media. So I really set off to see if there was a better way for parents to be able to share their stories online, stay connected with others, um, but allows a child to stay safe and allows that child to maintain control of their digital footprint. And you have some absolutes that you feel parents must do to keep their children safe online. Let's talk about a few of them. First, you say avoid using full names when referring to your kids on social media. Yeah, I think it's a good idea for parents to consider using initials or nicknames when they're talking about their kids online. It's also helpful for parents to remove their maiden name if that's something that they have from their public social media profiles. Also, parents should be really careful about not sharing information like their child's birth date, because that is something that folks who would want to do something with a child's identity might take advantage of, of having been shared and use that to harm the child. Sure. All right. So there's lots of good, helpful information, tips um, from both videos that I'm hoping parents um, take with them after this session. Your child's like. All right, so for social media, there are several things um, folks should be aware of. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't know of is that social media accounts are primarily meant for children 13 and older. Um, this is designated by federal law, but there's a lot of lack um, of like age verification on all these websites and platforms that allows anyone to sign up regardless of your age. So there's really not much in the way there that 
will prevent children from signing up for any um, social medias. Um, heavy use of social media can lead to excessive or addictive use. And um, unfortunately, it's used as a substitute for healthy face-to-face -face interactions. So it's important to limit screen time. Um, overexposure can also lead to mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts. And social media, um, unfortunately, allows people to access unhealthy peer groups. And these groups um, tend to focus on gambling, drugs, explicit materials, even cults and extremism. So just some things to keep in mind and be aware of when you're on, on social media. And your child also may share or receive sexually explicit pictures or videos. And it's important to remind people that sharing an explicit image of a minor is a crime, regardless if you're a minor or not, um, it shouldn't be done. And social media provides anonymous platforms for predators and traffickers to groom children. Um, it's a space where people can pretend to be who they are and um, target um, children, unfortunately. Um, Cyberbullying is also another big thing um, in social media. And no information, honestly, that's shared online is truly private in this digital world. So be very mindful of what you share. Um, here's a list of some digital safety do's and don'ts. So please protect your phone and check your phone's privacy settings. Pay attention and be careful where you click. Get parental approval um, for your child. Um, make sure that what they're opening and what they're using is safe. And yeah, there's definitely things um, you should tell your guardians or your parents, um, you know, if you're being harassed or bullied. Um, let people know um, in your immediate circle. Uh, you definitely don't want to share your identity or personal information, your name, address, phone number, passwords, all of that. You also don't want to allow others to harass you online. Um, Cyberbullying uh, can hurt you, can hurt a lot of people. Um, you don't also don't want to fill out any random surveys, memberships, or any applications asking personal info from unsecure websites or unfamiliar apps. You also please don't open, reply, or download attachments from spam or unknown senders. Um, this could carry some harmful um, information and viruses that will um, uh, steal your information. And you don't want to deal with all that. Uh, continued, when you're online, it's suggested to use a nickname for social media platforms or other applications. Don't use your real name. Uh, it's important to say, set the privacy and security settings on all your apps um, to keep your children as safe as possible. So if you're not aware of how to do that, um, please let someone know um, who can help you with that. Um, and make sure that you are aware of your child's usernames and if possible, um, get a hold of their passwords. And for some of the last don'ts that I have listed, um, don't use vulgar or sexually explicit language online. Don't share information that might hurt or embarrass others or yourself. And um, don't hide anything from your parents or teachers. Again, let them know if you're feeling um, uh, harassed or if there's any problems you're um, having online. Uh, some digital safety FAQs I have here listed. Um, how do I talk with my child about safety? So I would say you just talk with them how there's folks out there who are seeking to take advantage of you and would like to steal your information and money and that not everything online is what it appears to be. So it's important to make sure we think twice before we make that connection with someone. Um, and yeah, don't make this a one-time conversation. Uh, you have to keep talking about digital safety. Um, they might even know more about you um, honestly, um, a lot of the kids nowadays have grown up with tech, so they have an idea of what they should and shouldn't do it, but it's always good to review with them. Um, another FAQ uh, is how do we protect our family's computers? So it's important to use updated security software um, just because software companies might be able to find some uh, security issues that they will fix through these updates. 
So if you see updates on your phone or your computer for certain software, um, make sure to keep it updated to the latest. And again, be careful where you click. Malicious or fake websites can steal your personal info and they might even resemble a legitimate website. Uh, it might be offering something too good to be true or it'll offer forbidden content such as sexually explicit material, free movies or music. Um, so be careful where you click again and be smart about what passwords you use as well. If you're um, able to change passwords every so often and make sure they're strong, um, that's a good line of pr uh, protection. And make sure not to use the same password on all websites. Um, you don't want to have that compromise if someone finds out you know, your email or your password for your email and they can definitely um, cause a lot of harm there. So make sure to change up your passwords for every uh, website or application you use. Um, to protect your phones, I would say the first line of defense is using um, a solid pin or a password. Um, you also want to download apps from trusted sources. So Google Play, the Apple Store, um, those are legit places to download apps. Um, make sure you back up your data as well. Um, if you don't know how to do that, ask somebody who can help you out. And this is more um, to protect and restore your information if something were to happen. So um, I will take those steps and just take preventative measures um, just because it's happened in the past and it's happened to me too. Um, I've had to restore my phone and thankfully I've had all my data saved from a backup. Um, another thing you should do is log out of the websites after you're done making a payment. And um, again, keep your operating system and apps updated. So not just your computer, but your phone as well. And um, that's it for me. Um, thank you everybody for listening. Um, you know, this is really helpful information that we will provide to you all. And we will email out this slideshow um, for folks. And we have a website as well where we have information on the other three workshops that we've had and the slideshows at www.lbforward.org slash social media safety. Um, you can get all of that information there on our website. Um, thank you for listening to me and um, I'll pass the mic back on over to you, Ms. Joycelyn, to present our next speaker. Ms. Joycelyn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning again. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we are introducing Francesca Douglas Franco, Executive Director of Human Save. Francesca? I can't hear anything. Oh, no. Uh, can't hear Ms. Joyce Lynn. Um, please make sure that in can the image. Oh, now we can, yes. Okay, thank you. We are introducing um, Francesca Douglas Franco from Human and Save. We want to thank you so much for participating and being with us this morning. Take it away. Thank you so much, Ms. Joycelyn, and thank you so much, Long Beach Forward. I really um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, have a discussion with everybody here. Um, so just a little bit of background on me. My name is Francesca. Um, I founded and am the director of Human Save, which is a, a mental health organization that provides therapy to uh, human trafficking survivors as young as two years old. And we also do a lot of these awareness and prevention trainings for the community, for Long Beach Unified School District, and for businesses that are interested in uh, learning more about what they can do to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. So this is a really important topic. Um, and I grew up in Long Beach. Uh, I went to school there from first grade all the way through college. Um, and, and so being able to speak to parents with LBUSD is really important to me as well. Um, 
I went to Poly, and so one of the first schools that we've ever done these awareness and prevention workshops for was Poly, because um, I remember how um, how at risk we were as the kids that went there, and we had no idea, right? Yes, go Jack Robbins. <laughs> Susan put in the chat. Um, so I, I mean, thank you so much for this amazing presentation and the videos that you've sent um, or that you've uh, put up, Rudy. Um, I think that they touched on a lot of the fears that we as parents have and, and our desire to protect our kids. And I noticed from the chat that uh, the majority of us here have kids uh, in elementary school, and I have a daughter as well. And so this has come up multiple times. Um, before, before working with Human Save, I was working in law enforcement intel. And so I... <laughs> you know, they had us delete all of our accounts and all of our social media for that exact purpose. And so reintroducing myself um, into social media after my child was born was kind of uh, difficult to navigate. Um, and for a very, very long time, most of my accounts or all of my accounts were private until very recently when my work took me to um, a place where it was valuable to have the insight of, of my nine-year-old um, and, and her little sister. I do a lot of uh, workshops on parenting as well. So I think that a lot of what was shared um, in relation to, of course, turning off your geotagging um, on Google, especially on all of your apps. So Instagram, Facebook, anything that you post, um, making sure that your location is turned off, all of those really easy fixes, as in, you know, two-step fixes, um, things like uh, setting your profile to private and making sure that you know exactly who's following you. Um, and even then, of course, there's always something, I mean, we don't always know the people as well as we think they do, and we wouldn't know them predators are lurking, right? Like that is just kind of a reality of this world. Um, and we have to definitely always keep in mind that the internet was not created in order to keep our kids safe. Social media apps were not created or built with the infrastructure to keep our kids safe. So that becomes our responsibility. And as much as we want to blame um, all of these Silicon Valley geniuses that are making tons of money off of these apps, um, the reality is that, um, it, it is our responsibility to keep our kids safe and it, it can be really difficult, especially considering how quickly things are coming out, how many trends are coming out. Um, I, I know that this is something that I'm going to have to battle, especially when my kid is in high school and her world expands farther and farther out of, you know, our circle of protection as parents in the home. Um, so, but definitely doing the basics, um, being familiar with all of the apps that our kids, oh, I'm so sorry to the interpreter, Tangratha. I will try to speak more slowly. Um, being able to understand and, and know intimately each of the apps that our kids use is also very ideal whenever possible. Um, so you can imagine that when they are younger, it's a lot easier to start having these conversations in a very age appropriate way, right? So recently, last week, my kid asked me, you know, why can't I have a TikTok? All the kids in my class have a TikTok. And, you know, she asks it very innocuously. She's not very, she's not trying to be mean about it or hurt my feelings or, or, or you know, judge my decision not to allow her to do that. She really wants to know, you know, why can't I? And, and my answer was really clear. It's like, it's not a safe app. First of all, um, I, I don't know the verification of this, but I've heard from different sources. And I can't seem to find it, but it sounds like the person who created TikTok is not even allowing their own child to have a TikTok account. Um, and as somebody who works in anti-trafficking work, I cannot deny that there are a lot of predators on TikTok, that it is one of the most um, unsafe sites or apps for children, um, especially those who are younger, right? And so one of the things that I use to judge whether my kid is ready for something, whether it's an app or a movie or whatever, is am I willing to have this conversation with them now before? 
can I explain it to them in a way that they can understand and keep them safe without scaring them, without traumatizing them? And if the answer is no, then it's not age appropriate to me. And of course, every family is going to have a different gauge of what that is to them. Um, but particularly for TikTok and even uh, Instagram, I've mentioned to her before, um, and any game. So like Roblox, for instance, there's a lot of cases that have come up and we've, you know, we've worked with clients whose uh, kids were lured and groomed through Roblox and other open world sites where strangers can directly contact um, youth. And I've told her, because I don't know everything about this app and how to keep it safe and every single um, feature that will protect you from people I don't know, then I'm so sorry, I can't let you have this app. Um, and, and could I, you know, spend the hours that it would take to really play these games and figure out, you know, what the, what the loopholes are? Maybe, but I, I'm not willing to, right? So that's the kind of easy line that I'm drawing in the sand as a boundary. Um, other things like YouTube Kids, for instance, um, I still find some of the content on there to be inappropriate. So what I do is I'll vet a few videos with her from a specific uh, creator and I'll say, okay, well, that one I consider safe. You can subscribe to this um, and listen to this person's videos and, and so on and so forth. But I think a lot of it is just, as Rudy had mentioned in the slides, um, communication, right? Being able to, um, to tell them in a way that doesn't, it appropriately scares them, but doesn't traumatize them and letting them know there are people out there that are doing things that you, I don't want to have access to you. So for instance, I've mentioned to her, like in Roblox, there are people who pretend to be kids and want to play games with you and you won't notice. So my easy fix for that is you can't play with anybody unless you know who they are. Um, so for instance, um, in games that you can turn off the chat feature, I'll sit in there, I'll sit next to her and you know she'll be playing, I'll be working. Um, but we have a very open relationship in that sense where She's like, oh my gosh, somebody cursed. I like kicked them off of the whatever it was. Um, but I think it's really important to remember, um, especially in this context, that predators are where kids are. There is, I mean, in a creepy way, there's, there's no place that's actually we can consider 100% safe if kids are there because that's where the predators go. They follow the kids. And so the only things that we can do, like within our own power to do, are to build the resiliency and make sure that they're as protected as possible, right? Whatever that means to each of us as parents. Um, it, it definitely starts with these conversations and the trust and building connection. Because as a parent, if we're barking orders and we're expecting our kids to obey and um, without question, then the likelihood that they're going to rebel or do their own thing later on um, is much higher, right? So being humble in our approach to parenting and our approach to connecting is just as important, potentially more important than figuring out what these safety measures are, these one step, step two step, um, quick and easy fixes. Because those we can Google, right? And we can do them really quick. But the part that takes a long time is building this, this type of relationship where you are fulfilling all of their needs. And so no matter what app or what site or what room they're in, uh, there isn't somebody else who can swoop in and, and fill the gaps that we, we're missing out on. So are we seeing our kids, um, do, do they feel loved, seen, accepted, heard unconditionally by us? And if the answer is no, and we really have to be honest about this, um, if the answer is no, then those are the things that we need to work on to protect them right? Because we can't follow them everywhere. But wherever they go, if those cups are filled, then there's no room for a random person to swoop in and give them any of those things. And I think that the reason why so many kids get exploited through um, these apps in the first place is because it fulfills the need of connection. And that is what we as human beings, that's what we're seeking. That's what, what we're wired from the day we're born. And even before that, to seek. So if that cup is empty because we're working too much, because, you know, 
we don't know how to connect because we were never taught because the you know our parents grandparents they they didn't know how either then we have to be the ones to learn right we have to shoulder that burden this very difficult thing and and learn um these are really the things in my opinion that protect um kids because i will be honest in saying that um in terms of human trafficking the thing that makes anyone the most um, susceptible to being trafficked is 100% childhood sexual abuse, prior childhood sexual abuse. That almost every kid who's been trafficked was first sexually abused. And then same thing when we ask um, our adult clients as well. So the things that protect them from that, um, I'm so sorry, Joycelyn, am I out of time? No, you're good. Just talk a little bit more slowly so that translators can um, catch up, interpreters. All right. Well, first, I, I will, at this point, I'd like to um, ask if anyone has any questions on anything I've said so far. Comments, questions, no? I have one. Okay. Uh, well, it's more of a comment and you hit on what I was thinking all along. I think the approach to how things are explained to children does make a difference because there's a streak where they want to be with their peers they and things like that. But then when you take the approaches that have been put forth in the back of their minds, they know that their parents, caregivers, et cetera, whoever it is trying to protect them is doing, this is coming from a place of love. And that's really, really important. And, and I found that children are more apt to listen when they know that you care. So thank you so much. Thank you for that comment. Yes, absolutely. When they know that we're not setting boundaries um, to punish them, Right. or to uh, be authoritative, right? To just to, just for the sake of telling them what to do. I think, yes, it makes a huge difference in how this information is received. And of course that has to be all the way across the board, right? It's how um, we set boundaries all throughout their lives. You know, if, if it's, you need to pick up your toys before you um, play a new toy or whatever it is that we tell them, it just has to be that we are consistent and we are safe. So the best way to keep our kids safe is for us to be safe um, as, as individuals, for them to be able to come to us and be like, you know what, this is a really weird thing that somebody said to me the other day. Like, can you take a look at this chat or whatever it is? Um, something my classmate said to me. Um, and, and for us to be able to listen without freaking out, because there will come a time where, I mean, high school parents, you probably know this, there will come a time where we're going to have to hold space for our kids, even if we're panicking. <laughs> and that's just the reality. I'm thinking back to my childhood and, um, you know, my mom's capacity to really sit there with me and hear what I was telling her, even if what I was telling her was probably could be scary. Um, and so for us as parents, just learning um, these tools and constantly um, making sure that we're keeping up with the trends and keeping up with the whys. Why do kids need to be on TikTok? And what do they get out of a billion views, right? Like, what do they get out of that? It's attention. And so something that I've done with my kids, my kids, because my nine-year-old goes to school and her friends have TikTok, so she knows these dances, right? I mean, obviously they're not allowed to have their phones out in school, so she's not being recorded or anything. But when she comes home and shows me, sometimes I'll sit there and I'll record it with her. I'm like, hey, let's send this to your grandma you know, let's send this to whoever. And so that same need is being fulfilled. It's like, I, Hey, I learned this really cool thing. I think it's funny and I want to share it. Um, does it need to be shared with a thousand strangers? No. Um, and, and like I said, you know, I think that it's not always possible to not share anything about our kids ever, but I think it's also important for us to be responsible about it. Will this be potentially humiliating at some point? We can't take it back right? Anything and everything that's there. Um, and if you don't know the answer to it, then I think it's best to just stay safe and, and not, right? Um, I think there's a lot of things that parents think are funny and cute that when we grow up, we kind of cringe looking back at it, like, no, please don't show that photo <laughs> or, you know, anything like that. Um, 
I think somebody wrote, Susan wrote online, uh, kids think views or being famous online means that lots of people will like them. Talking about the downsides of that can help too, right? Not to fear monger, but just to know that not everyone is kind online, definitely. And, and yes, right? Like everyone thinks that they have access to you. Everyone thinks that they're entitled to uh, having an opinion on you know, how you look, how you dress, all of these things, definitely. But I also think that if we as parents and families fulfill that need to be liked, right, we really, really like our kids genuinely and do whatever it takes to make sure it's that's true. It's not always easy. You know, our kids can, of course, annoy us um, just like we annoy them. Um, but but to come to that place where where they feel unconditionally accepted, they won't care about those likes that much. Like it might be exciting, but it won't do the same thing for that kid as it would for a kid who is not being seen at home. Um, and again, not to pass any kinds of judgment here, because the reality is that some of us are just are working so many hours. It's not possible or the 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 amount of energy that it would take after working that long to really connect with our kids feels impossible. But just to make the effort, you know, Every day, 10 minutes of, of uninterrupted, I'm seeing you, tell me something, tell me a story, let me hold you, let me hug you. Our teenagers still need to be held and hugged. Our, our elementary school kids still need to be held and hugged. Um, I think we become disempowered um, to, to reach out and make those connections. And then so whatever it is that they're missing from us is what they're seeking everywhere else. And so if we make sure those needs are met, then even if on the outside it looks the same, on the inside, it's going to feel really different for them. They're not going to care about these things. It's not going to make or break them. And then Joyce Lynn said, plus some people get famous and that's a draw. Yes, right? Like, especially in the United States, I feel like being famous, being TikTok famous, Instagram famous, whatever it is, is so appealing um, or it can be so appealing. But I've also found that when you're less and less entrenched in that, so like my kid, for instance, doesn't have her own account. She doesn't really have the concept of what that means. It's not really a goal because she's not watching so many people who are famous, if that makes sense. But in high school, that's really like impossible to avoid, right? Mr. Beast or whoever these, um, these celebrities are. So I think it's also important to make, um, to have that conversation about them, about, um, about famous people that you do admire, because they're going to care about who's famous and who's not. Um, so why not talk about people who are famous that you actually admire and why you admire these qualities in them? It's not just the fact that everybody likes them or likes all their videos, but, you know, what are the things that you as a person, as an individual, but then also in a family system, what are the characteristics of people that you admire? There's just, there's a lot. Um, does anyone have any questions or um, comments? I don't wanna get too far off. And then am I speaking slowly enough? I'm so sorry, Tongrata. I tend to start talking faster. Nope. Am I still good on time, Ms. Joyce Lynn? I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, so just really quickly to recap, definitely go um, onto the apps of your kids and look at the security settings. You know, don't be snatching things out of their hand and, and, and try expecting them to be okay with it. You know, really respectfully, like, hey, you know, there's these things that I've heard and I've seen about um, this app could be really dangerous if a random person um, contacted you through there. And, and there's these things called deep fakes where people can look like somebody else and sound like somebody else. So it would be much safer for you to only talk to people that you know. They are in the bedroom with you. Wherever you bring your phone, wherever you bring your tablet, wherever you bring your computer, consider it like that person is right in front of you. And so whatever you would say to somebody in front of your face, that's what you should be sharing and not sharing if, you know, online. And so looking at the security settings, making sure that no one can message them, especially if they're younger. Um, 
finding alternatives. Like for me, I love Minecraft, the version that's on a switch, right? Because it's closed world. You can do whatever you want. There's no online component. I think somebody on the chat mentioned that she allows her child to play games that are, um, that have no online component or Kindle apps, right? But, but online disabled, that's the safest bet where no one has access to your kid. But as they grow up, it is important to, to know the role of the connection you have with your kid, the amount of communication and trust that you've built, whether they consider you to be a safe person, whether you would have considered yourself to be a safe person at their age, um, and really making sure that that is the foundation for all the conversations that you have. Because they do, they grow up, and they go into their own spheres of, of being. And so, you know, are you somebody that they can come to when something scary does happen? Because eventually it could. And that's all. If anyone has any questions, I think I've got like two minutes left. And if not, then I will hand it back over to you guys, Rudy. Awesome. Thank you so much, Francesca. Um, if folks want to connect with her, um, we'll provide information in the chat. Um, feel free to send Francesca an email at francesca at humansafe.org or learn more about humansafe at www.humansafe.org. Thanks again, Francesca. I uh, really appreciate you taking time out of your day and talking to our community and our parents. So moving on, we're going to move on to our opportunity drawing, our first opportunity drawing. Um, so anybody who has joined us today, we will um, put in your names on the virtual wheel and we'll select three winners right now. Um, is the wheel ready by chance, Diana? Let me get that set up for you. Oops. All right, we have all our entrants in here. All right, we're spinning the first one, right? I believe. Okay, so we have a winner. Whoever is- Hello, hello. 832. Hello, my name, Kim Sreyung. Hello. Yeah, can we- um... I didn't see my name. Kim Sreyung. Sorry. I didn't see my name. What's your name? Kim Sreyung, K-I-M-S-R-E-N-G. N-U-N-G. Okay, oh, you're the guy. here. Got you, thank you. We'll take note of that. So we have two winners, Fala and Kim Sreyung. Kim Sreyung. That's, that's how you pronounce it, right? Kim Sreyung. Okay, Kim Sereng and Fala, and we'll have one more. Thank you. And safety, who, who is safety? Winner number three. Can you get off the mic please and share your name? Kim Sreng Ng, do you see my name? Yes, we, we have you, Kim Sreng. Thank you. Who is safety? Does anybody want to get off the mic and share? We can do one more just in case. Yeah, let's do one more. All right. 
Yes, token yes. theory. Awesome. Congratulations. We have our three winners, four winners. And don't worry about it. We'll have more opportunity drawings later on in our workshop. So if you didn't win this time, there's always an opportunity on the second drawing. Um, all right, let's get back to our slides. Give me one sec. Let me share my screen. So right. Rudy, we are going to pivot um, because our guest isn't here. So we're going to show his video toward the end um, of the workshop. So um, what we'd like to do now is uh, we have another video that we'd like to show. Um, Rudy, it's the why you should rethink posting photos of your children on social media today. And then I'm going to share a PTA resource called the Smart Talk afterward. Yeah, this is another pretty insightful video um, that I would like to share with you all. This phenomenon is called. Let me get to Spanish subtitles. Oops. Okay. Digital kidnapping, and yes, it is as scary as it sounds. As parents, we love to take photos of our kids and post them. It's a great way to keep our family and friends in the loop. But now experts are issuing this new alert that bad guys are using our posts against us to track our children. This morning, you're about to see how they do it, plus the simple setting on your phone that you can change right now to protect your family. You're being captured from Facebook to Instagram, parents sharing their children's lives online. But now the new world crime, digital kidnapping, predators stealing your kids' photos and spreading them online. This stranger posting on Facebook claiming this girl was his daughter. In another recent case, a child's photo was tagged on a porn site. Turns out most of us are putting our own families at risk, and we have no idea. Happy Thursday. You post all the time. Yeah, I like to post about the kids. That's Michelle and Reese. They think we're doing a general story about social media. What they don't know? Back in Ohio, cyber safety expert Jesse Weinberger is poring over their social media pages, checking for private information. So what do you find here? Through mom's Facebook account and everything that she's posted, I was able to find out husband's name, children's names. She has two children. I know their ages. I know their dates of birth. I know where they go to school. I have the address of the school. I have the name of the teacher. I know exactly which playgrounds they visit, how often they like to go to each playground. You were showing me a map where you're actually able to find out the path they take to school, how they walk and when. Right. It wasn't hard. But even scarier, she says our photos can have a hidden location signature embedded in them. Even if you don't tag the location, anyone can still find out where you are. What's the danger here? For example, I know that one of her children broke his leg. How easy would it for me to be to come up to the kid and say, oh, you don't remember me, but I was the nurse when you came to the emergency room. How's your leg feeling? Come with me. Come with me. Time for the moment of truth. Come have a seat right over here. I tell Michelle and Reese what we uncovered. We actually had a cybersecurity expert pour through your social media pages, and she put together a dossier on your children. Okay. On wow. your family. Found out some pretty creepy stuff. <laughs> I know your two sons are Oxford and Ozark. I know where they go to school. I know your route to school. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> I also know that your son likes to play chess. Yes. Ozark does. He's participated in youth wrestling. Yes. I don't want to say their last names, but I know your kids' babysitter's names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who's Grammy B? That's my mom. Your mom. Yeah. Think about the information, even the, just that I've said so far. If this were a bad person, an online predator, I know where your kids go to school, I can walk up and say, hey, Grammy B sent me. And suddenly, mm -hmm. they can get away with your child. You don't want to set your child up for something dangerous. And we don't even realize it. And I'm a parent, too, and I yeah. do the same thing. I think we all do. Yeah, I mean, it's real, it's it's very scary. So how do you protect your family? On Instagram, make your profile private like that. And on Facebook, click on settings, then privacy, and change right here from public to friends only. And go a step further. On Facebook, 
categorize your friends in terms of safety. Make separate groups for those you trust the most. And when you post, only share your kids' photos with them. And remember that hidden location feature in some photos? Go to your phone's privacy settings, the camera section, and make sure the location function is off. Also, never put your kids in your profile or cover photo. Those are always public. It's definitely a really good reminder for all of us to know there are people out in this world, and they're using that information to do bad things. By the way, as we sit here, you're going through your Facebook yeah, settings and no, your no, phone no, settings. No. It's true. We're gonna. I'm going to show you as soon as we're yeah, off the air. I'm going to show you again. But here's <laughs> another tip for you. You know you change your clocks every time it's daylight saving time. Experts say use that as a reminder to go through your friends on social media and clean house. Delete anyone who you're not friends with anymore. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, sometimes we just collect friends sure. on social media. Yeah, yeah. Go through it a couple of times a year to make sure. All right. That's a little bit about... Um social media and you know some of the things that you should think about before posting online again um now we're gonna move on to another slide to talk about some pta resources and some other um places where folks can get some valuable information thank you so what we have here is a really cool PTA resource that our intern Angelica from Pell State Long Beach found for us. Um, this was created in partnership with Norton Antivirus and it's called the Smart Talk. It's an online tool that helps parents and educators or caregivers have proactive, positive conversations with kids. So what you do on this website, it's free. You go through guided questions to help your kids, they're recommending between the ages of five to 18, to actively participate in setting limits around the device, devices, digital safety, privacy, communication, health and wellness, and media choices. And the end result then is to create a, a technology agreement that's based on your individual responses. So I am gonna, share the screen just to show folks this for a couple of minutes um, so that people know that this is a resource that you can use. So let's see if I can share this screen. I cannot. Um, Rudy, could you go to the webpage? It's thesmarttalk.org and we'll just walk through it. Thank you. So basically you can create an account and then you sit down with your kid um, you could do this with parents, too, if you work with parents, and you go through some of these questions um, and, and answer them as you go. So this is the home page right at the top there on the top right. Once you create an account, you'll click the login button. Scroll down, uh, Rudy, for a moment. So this gives you some information about why this uh, website and tool is useful. Keep scrolling. How it works then. So there is a tutorial to show you how to do it. The next thing you do is you're gonna to wanna to sit as a family, uh, go up, we're gonna go through these icons to talk about this, the conversation. Then you'll follow along the smart guide with some questions on some key digital safety topics. And then really what we've been sharing with families as we've been holding these social media workshops is it's really important to have these discussions and talk honestly. Also take away a little bit of judgment with your kids. You know they. Our young people today are digital natives, and this is their norm. Um, I was, I have my nieces here for spring break, and we were in my bedroom, and I was, something called my attention to my phone. I looked up, my two nieces and my two daughters were all in this little bedroom, all on our phones. Like, our phones and our devices are a huge part of our life. You see it when you're walking down the street, people are crossing the street, holding their devices in front of their face. You see it in restaurants. I always joke around because you can even find people in the bathroom on their phones, right? Um, so the last step is to then agree to do this plan. So you can download it, print it, or email it. It turns out a lot of the online so, uh, safety resources we found are predominantly in English. So our team is committed to spending this next week or two to see if there are any resources available in other languages. And we're also considering um, partnering 
um, with perhaps an organization to create some more materials in other languages for families so that families can access this information. So stay tuned on our website and in our emails um, to see you know, what progress we make. We'll definitely share these resources with you. Uh, scroll down again, Rudy, a little bit more. So here you can see the partners who helped to create uh, this tool. And then let's go way back to the top and we will go ahead and try the get started button. Let's just walk through that for a couple minutes. So what you'll do is you'll create an account. You don't have to do this, Rudy, or you can continue as a guest. Let's hit that button. It was pretty user-friendly. Angelica and I both created um, accounts. And so it, it's also a fun looking website, right? It's fun to look at. So as you scroll down, this reminds you some things to do. So get ready. You'll add each of your kids and their ages to the dashboard. You'll fill out the answers to the quiz. And then you'll invite your kid. Uh, to be part of the conversation, and they recommend that you set a time, whether it's, you know, hey, we'll do it tonight after dinner, or tomorrow, Saturday, you know, whatever, Sunday, let's continue on. So they want you to really commit to have the conversation. It doesn't have to be too long. Scroll down some more, and here's some pointers for when you're talking to your kids about online safety. Be open, listen with empathy. Their world is really different than the way our world was, right? especially because of social media and the internet and technology. Then they recommend that you take turns, whether it's with this site or any of the materials that we share on our website or any conversation about social media, even if it's little kids, taking terms to, turns and normalizing listening to one another, listening um, and engaging kids in sharing their feelings, their experiences, because it could turn into a conversation around cyberbullying. It could turn into a conversation about them um, uh, seeing a picture or an image that was inappropriate and they're trying to understand it. Step three, stay focused. Use your device to navigate the quiz, but remove any other distractions for your kid or yourself. So focus on the conversation and then skip as needed if there's any question that is like makes your kid a little uncomfortable. Uh, this website will save your progress as you go. And then lastly, after you talk, celebrate it. Show some excitement for what you've accomplished. You know, you can make it fun. Keep it in sight. So put your, you know, copy of your agreement. If you wrote it down or printed it out, or if you just do one on your own, put it on your refrigerator or next to the computer. And then schedule check-ins here and then. And I'm telling you, the earlier you do this, the better, because it normalizes this conversation with kids. Lastly, update your agreement um, with guidelines as they continue to get older. Let's click that last button, Rudy, for add a child, just so we can see what it looks like. So you all can get a sense. So basically you'd put in the name of the kid, who you are, the kid's age range, and it's just that simple. Super fun site. So we're hoping you all will share that. I'm also seeing some resources in the chat and we will be sure to put these on our website and to email them out to all of our attendees as well. So I see Jackie's putting in missingkids.org slash netsmarts as well. Awesome. Thanks, Rudy, for showing that. So thanks, everyone, for uh, taking a moment to pause and look at this tool. We do hope that you will utilize it. So now what we're going to do is our guest from the school district was not able to make it this morning. However, we have great news because he produced a really beautiful 14-minute video for our um, community around our social the social media guide uh, through the school district. His name is Chris Itson. We'll put his email in the chat, and we're going to watch his video next. Uh, Rudy, share audio. I think you have to restart the share. media and LBUSD. Can you uh, hear it now? I spent a considerable amount of time not only engaging Good to go. platforms, but also really thinking about the complexities, the advantages, uh, the dangers of social media, and what could possibly be next. And in a relatively short amount of time, the world of social media has not only grown exponentially, but it's now part of our modern reality, whether we use it or not. And when I'm feeling overwhelmed with this work, I often return to this quote. 
The first rule of social media is that everything changes all the time. But what won't change is the community's desire to network. And that last point about the community's desire to network reminds me that even with all the challenges of social media, many of these tools, if they're used appropriately, they can provide important human connections and they can even give voice to those often left out of the conversation. Hi, I'm Chris Itzen and I'm the Assistant Director of LBUSD's Marketing and Media Services Department. And I'm also the District Administrator who oversees social media. I'm a former classroom teacher and swim coach, and I'm also a parent of an LBUSD student. I'm really excited today to share this important information with families and caregivers in order to help support all of our students when it comes to safely and effectively using social media. Did the sound just go out for everyone? Uh, Rudy? Part definition of social okay, media. Okay, it's working again. Social media is a collective term for websites and applications that focus on communication, interaction, content sharing, and collaboration. Two, people use social media to keep in touch, interact with friends, family, various communities, and others they may share similar interests with. And third, businesses use social applications to promote and sell their products and track customer concerns. When it comes to most social media accounts, an individual must be at least 13 years old to use a given platform. However, many people believe there should be more stringent age restrictions and that the usage should even be for older students or even sometimes people say just for adults. And whether you're a parent or caregiver that allows your middle schooler or your high schooler to use a social media platform or you're one that restricts usage, you're going to hear me say a few times today that it is vital to be aware of what's out there, regardless of your stance. So let's start by talking about some of the benefits. So the first one I would bring up is creating a positive digital footprint and digital resume early on in life. So especially around 16, students can get on LinkedIn and they can start to build a digital profile that shows the professional world their accomplishments, their focus, their drive, and what they want to do after school. Another really great point of social media for students is free access to a massive amount of information from reliable sources. There are how-to tutorials for things like math, history, art, current events. I think about it all the time. Anytime I want to do or build something around my house, I can always go to YouTube and check that first. And there's often great resources and information that can be used. Our students have more access to information than ever before. And another way is easy access to inclusive communities they may identify with or have similar interests. There's social media groups about sports, outdoor activities, fitness, uh, book clubs, um, the way you identify, there are a lot of ways that students can connect using these social networks. And I'd say another resource is sites that provide ongoing resources for affirmation, self-esteem building, and social resources. So like motivation pages, nonprofits that support various communities, resources out there that they can find on these platforms. And when used appropriately, social media allows so many options for us to connect and share information. But of course, there are a lot of downsides. So while this is not a comprehensive list, and you'll, you'll find a lot more in our social media guide that we're going to provide at the end of this presentation, here's a few things to really start with and think about because there's some of the most pressing negative side effects for teens in social media. So the first is anonymity. There's social media websites like Lipsy, LMK Anonymous Polls, Telonym, YOLO, or AMA accounts, which encourage ask me anything questions from anyone on the internet. On these sites, users can almost never verify who exactly they're interacting with. So your child could be talking to somebody dangerous, somebody random, who knows? And also, teens may feel that their comments are consequence-free. They can say whatever they want, which may end up hurting others if those get out. Because just because something's anonymous doesn't mean someone can't screen capture it or figure out other ways to share it creatively. And that could come back to negatively affect your teen's future. So make sure your teen understands the risks involved with using anonymity websites. And now the big one and the popular one that most of us know, cyberbullying. Despite the efforts from many social media apps to combat bullying through improved monitoring and reporting features, cyberbullying is at an all-time high. Some examples are tea accounts or gossip accounts. Those are becoming increasingly prevalent for sharing gossip and harassing students online. So first and foremost, make sure your child understands how to report and block other users and review our LBUSD policy about cyberbullying that we'll share for you to get to in the end of this presentation. And another big one, you may have seen the HBO show that covered this, but an issue is catfishing. And this is a term that's used for a person who poses online as someone else in order to manipulate their victims. 
teens are especially susceptible to catfishing because they often friend people that they don't know or they share too much in personal information online. So talk with your student and let them know random chatting apps are not safe ever. If they're truly trying to meet new friends, it might be best to start on an app that's interest-based with text-based group forums. That's a safe way to start. Now let's talk about location tracking and sharing. These options are commonly used on social media apps and can be accessed by strangers. Turn off location settings on your child's social media accounts and check to see whether previous posts include information. Students should not be sharing where they're at at all times. Many parents like to keep track of their young ones using an app like Life360, which you can Google. In such instances, you can keep location services on only for those apps, but have them shut off for everything else. And now another really big one to be aware of are secret chat rooms or also called private chats. They may allow for unrestricted conversations, sexual content, or hate speech. Some app examples are Discord and IMVU, and there's a lot more popping up these days. However, sometimes adolescents create a private chat room with friends on any platform to safeguard against strangers. But in general, adolescents should be very cautious about joining chat rooms and be on the alert for predatory behavior. And the last one we'll cover in this negative section is false information. The world of social media, unfortunately, includes a tremendous amount of false and misleading info. So talk with your student about how to verify using reputable sources and to always fact check rumors they find on posts, even from their peers. All the time we have instances where somebody, a student posts something online that is untrue or unverified and it spreads like wildfire and students automatically believe it and get involved in things that often can negatively affect them. And I can say to you as a parent, I'm often petrified thinking about the dangers of social media. However, I'm constantly reminding myself that these tools are here to stay. And the more I know will help me ensure that my own family is safe. So I believe this quote by Nelson Mandela is the first answer to the question of how do I keep my students safe when they use social media. Educating yourself is the jumping off point in keeping your students safe online and even in helping them use these tools in ways that can benefit them both emotionally and academically. It starts with awareness about what's out there and how teens are using social media and also knowing where to find resources, which again, we're going to give you some resources at the end of this presentation. But from there, once you know what's going on and you have those resources, you need to think about keeping the lines of communication open with your child. And of course, modeling positive behavior on your end if you use social media. So now I'm going to share the story of our friend Dorothy. And as I share with this with you, I want you to think about the big picture. What do these events tell us about kids and their social media use in 2022? So now let's meet Dorothy. As you can see, this is a Twitter post. And Dorothy is broken up and heartbroken. And she says, I'm leaving forever. My mom took my phone. I miss you all. Shaking my head, I'm crying goodbye. And hashtag ACNL is a animal farm simulation game online. So she's tagging that and posting this out to the community that she plays this with on Twitter. Now, you'll notice something significant if you look at what's circled on the slide. She's not on a phone. She's on a Nintendo 3DS image, image share, which is on a video game platform. So at this point, we could probably assume that her phone has been taken away, but she still found a way to connect to social media. All right, hashtag busted. So now Dorothy's mom jumps on her account and says, I've seen that Dorothy has been using Twitter on her Nintendo. This account will be shut down now. Good job, mom. So mom has stepped in. She's taken the phone. Dorothy is not. She's at home, so she's not connecting with friends she's not using someone else's phone she has the video game system taken away so now she's going to have to wait while she goes through this restriction she's off social media but there's more so twitter gets involved so the twitter plat account for twitter post hashtag free dorothy now they want dorothy back right because these companies they want kids online they want us online consuming constantly all the time so they're adding a little fuel to the fire in this part so now all of a sudden you see Dorothy pop back up on social media and it says hashtag we university. Hello, my mom took my phone in Nintendo DS, so I have no choice but to use my Wii. Thank you all for the support and love. I will answer my DMs and follow back when I have a stable connection to Twitter. Bye. Love Dorothy. Now Dorothy is on another video game system that has an open source that can be used online to connect on social media. So even though mom has taken phone, she's been isolated, one device has been taken away. Dorothy knows another way to still connect and stay online. Ah, uh, but not today, Dorothy. 
So now I've seen that Dorothy has been using Twitter on her Wii and now all her devices have been taken away. So now mom has gone scorched earth. She's taken everything. Dorothy has no way to connect. Or does she? Take a look at the next slide. Because Dorothy ain't done. I do not know if this is going to tweet. I'm talking to my fridge. What the heck? My mom compensated all of my electronics again. And if you notice again, what's circled, she's speaking to an LG smart refrigerator. And of course, on Twitter, LG Electronics says, hashtag free Dorothy. So what does this tell us? Even as Dorothy's mom was conscientious, taking away her phone, figuring out, monitoring and staying on Dorothy and taking away the video games, she found another way because social media and all this technology is becoming more and more integrated into our daily lives. And for our current and future students, social media is part of the fabric of society. It now affects all aspects of pop culture, how most people consume information and news. And as you probably know, it's become a major part of our political culture and it just keeps growing. In order to help you and your child navigate the safe and effective use of social media, our team has developed the LUSC Social Media Guide for Students and Families. This document is a comprehensive set of resources for students and families to safely work through the complex world of social media. This interactive document is currently available at lbschools.net slash media in English, and it will be available in Spanish in the spring of 2023. So as we end, let's hear from one of our staff members about what this guide has to offer you and your students. And once you get your copy, check out all of the student videos, podcasts, infographics, and more resources linked in the guide. And with that, hey, Chris, take it away. Hey there. Did you know that over half of the world's population use some form of social media on a weekly basis? Whether liking a photo of a gorgeous sunset posted by a popular influencer on Instagram or tweeting about the latest current events or commenting on a family member's vacation photos on Facebook, it seems these days that almost everyone is connecting in the digital sphere. In a short period of time, social media has become one of the most dominant ways that billions of people communicate all over the world. And these tools are only going to grow in use and evolve over time. And spoiler alert, your student will be impacted by social media, whether they use it or not. While social media platforms can be downright dangerous if used incorrectly and can have serious consequences for those that use them inappropriately, they also can be powerful tools to support students with research and learning about current events in real time. They can help them connect with others who share similar interests, and they can even be used to build an effective digital resume in preparation for college and career. Now, the first step in supporting your students safely using social media is to do your research. And I know what you're thinking. Where do I even start? Well, our team has compiled a trove of resources to support families in navigating the complex world of social media. In the student section of this guide, you can find information on social media tips for smart social networking, safe and responsible practices, how to build a professional portfolio using LinkedIn, and social media consequences in LBUSD. Now in the parents section, we've highlighted common social media red flags, LBUSD board of ed policies regarding social media use, a link to the annual LBUSD guidelines for parents and students handbook, and links to external resources such as commonsensemedia.org that provides a massive database filled with articles and statistics about social media that are designed specifically for parents, guardians, and students. There's also a resources for parents and families Google folder that is filled with tons of resources you can freely use to learn more about the safe use of social media. And don't forget to talk to your kids about social media use on a routine basis. As the digital world continues to grow at an exponential rate, it's vital that you are aware of how your student is using these platforms. Building an open relationship centered on trust and communication is key. What platforms are they using? What do they like about social media? Who are they friending? Who are they following? What might be some challenges they're facing? And also, be mindful of your own use of these platforms. One of the most effective ways you can support your student is by modeling safe and appropriate behavior online. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching Chris share a little bit about the social media guide that the school district provides us. And now we're going to transition on to our final spin the wheel gift card opportunity drawing. Is everybody ready? It's Sad, I'm, I'm Let's go. All right, our final winners. 
First up is Valfrey Alvarado. Congratulations. Yeah. Our sixth winner, Sharon Thomas. Congratulations. We're pretty excited for you as well. Sorry, I didn't see my, my name. Am I doing one more? Yes. Okay. Yeah, if you already won, your name's taken off the list and you will be contacted. Last winner is... All right, congratulations, folks. Yeah. Um, People talking. <coughs> All right. Oh, but 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 Selene. So, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to all the winners. Um, Rudy Kirsten is saying, or I hope I'm saying her name right, but she said that the um, district social media guide is getting a 404 page, and if you guys have a another link. Oh, okay, thanks for bringing that up, Kristen. Um, we will have that updated for you. Um, can someone check that link for me, please? Um, everything will be updated once we have our website up and running. Um, all the slideshows, all the resources that we've shared throughout the workshop series, uh, we will have them on our website. I'll uh, check it out. Looks like they did a website makeover. We'll see if we can find it for you. Otherwise, we'll email it. Thank you. All right. Um, so now that we're wrapping up, um, again, I want to thank you all for being here, making time to best protect your families in this digital age. Um, and yeah, we just want to give a big thanks to our special guests who joined us, as well as those who weren't be able, able to join us here today, but were able to record videos for us. Um, thanks to our partners, speakers. Um, Francesca Douglas Franco with Human Save, thank you. Chris Hitson with the school district. Angelica Garcia, our fabulous Cal State Long Beach intern, our wonderful Best Start Central Long Beach team. And a, another big thank you to Ms. Joycelyn for her leadership and vision for this workshop series. Um, and obviously, we want to thank you, parents and caregivers, for your presence today. We hope you will share this information with other families, parents, and caregivers you know. Um, through these past workshops, uh, we've learned a lot. We've shared a lot of information, um, lots of great online resources to help families, caregivers um, learn how to navigate the online digital safety. So as I mentioned, this web, this, all this information will be at lb4.org slash social media safety. Um, stay tuned in the following week for updates on all of that. Um, we'll have slides for your continued learning um, and yeah, we'll just archive all those resources we've explored together. Um, if we want, we could access the website itself so we can check it out. So here's our website where we have our social media safety education resources. We have some video highlights from our in-person panel discussion last month. There's <clears throat> information on our preventing online child abuse workshop, online predators, internet safety 101, and then we will have this video uploaded of today's workshop on digital safety do's and don'ts. All right. With that being said, we are going to wrap up this PowerPoint and then we will, um, one last 
final question for our folks um, to share out today. We will. Um, Can you yeah, share the slide, Rudy? Yeah, the slide. The slide should be up, right? I think. Yeah. They disappeared. Oh, forgot. I'm not sharing. Oops. Give me one sec. Let me get located. Okay. All right, here's our slides again. So thanks again, everybody. Um, yeah, if you could share one word to describe your experience today, um, that would be helpful um, just so that we can take this feedback and take it to our team for future um, sessions, future workshops. Let me check the chat. Some folks are saying they feel grateful, validated. Other folks are feeling educated, full, wonderful, appreciative, great info, increíble. So it's, it's poder, it's powerful. So lots of good responses. Very happy to hear. And for folks, for everybody, um, once again, we really thank you for joining us. And if you want to learn more about Best, Best Start Central Long Beach, what we're doing, um, please check out our Facebook page. That's our primary place where we have updates on workshops, community events, resources, all of that good stuff for children and their families. So facebook.com slash bestartcob. And if you have an Instagram account, we also have a Best Start COB Instagram and a Twitter account. So all of them, you would be able to find them at Best Start CLB. All right. Um, with that being said, thank you very much, folks. Um, we want to give you the rest of your day back, but we truly appreciate you for coming out this morning and joining us virtually to learn about digital safety do's and don'ts. Yay, right. congratulations. Thanks, Ms. Joyce Lynn. We did four of these workshops for community and it has been really wonderful. Thanks everyone. Have a beautiful, wonderful, safe weekend and have those smart talks with the kids in your lives. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.